So in the last lecture, we were talking about caches and cache efficient algorithms. In the lecture today, I'd like to start out by introducing an idealized cache model. And the basic motivation for this is if we're going to analyze algorithms and their performance with respect to caching, we need some sort of model that we can employ for the cache. And ideally, we'd like this model to be relatively simple. Otherwise, the analysis that we perform is going to be quite complicated to do. Uh, so this is basically what motivates the uh, so-called idealized cache model that I'm going to introduce here. So this particular idealized cache model employs a two-level memory hierarchy. There's a single level of cache and then main memory. These are the two levels in the memory hierarchy. There are three key assumptions that are made by this idealized cache model. The first is that the cache is fully associative. The second is that the cache employs an optimal replacement policy. In other words, the cache is omniscient. It can peer into the future and figure out which cache block is going to be used furthest into the future, and then it can choose to evict that particular cache block. And then the third assumption is that the cache is tall. Now this particular idealized model, it's only a very crude approximation to real world caches. And some of these assumptions are more questionable than others. The assumption that the cache is fully associative is not completely realistic in the sense that real world caches tend not to be fully associative. Usually they're K-way set associative for some relatively small value for K. Uh, with respect to the second assumption made about the in the idealized cache model that the cache employs an optimal replacement policy, this is clearly question very questionable because this requires non-causal hardware. In other words, it's not physically realizable because the optimal replacement policy would require predicting the future, which obviously we can't do. And then the last assumption that the cache is tall, it turns out that real world caches often tend to satisfy this, this uh, requirement. Uh, so it's not such a bad assumption. So of these assumptions, the one that's most questionable is the one of the optimal replacement policy. So I'm gonna look at this in a little bit more detail to try to motivate why it's actually a reasonable assumption to make. So as we've seen, one of the assumptions made by the idealized cache model is that the cache employs an optimal replacement policy. And of course, it's very reasonable to question the validity of such an assumption, because clearly we can't implement an optimal replacement policy. It would require non-causal hardware. Uh, but it turns out that this is not such an unreasonable assumption to make. Essentially, uh, in a paper by uh, Slater and Tarjan, they showed that, well, they showed the following result. If you have an algorithm that incurs Q cache misses on an ideal cache of size M, then on a fully associative cache of size 2M, in other words, of twice the size that employs the least recently used replacement policy, at most two Q cache misses are obtained. In other words, the, the main result here is that to within a constant factor, least recently used replacement is as good as optimal replacement as long as the cache is fully associative. So for this reason, if we're doing asymptotic analysis, for example, since asymptotic analysis doesn't care about constant factors, it's quite justified to make the assumption of, of a cache which employs an optimal replacement policy uh, because the only difference is within a constant factor between LRU versus an optimal replacement policy. So in this sense, the assumption of an optimal replacement policy is quite reasonable. Earlier, I introduced the notion of cache oblivious and cache aware algorithms. In this course, we're gonna be focusing predominantly on cache oblivious algorithms. And when we're analyzing cache oblivious algorithms, often we use the idealized cache model to do this um, because often the analysis is asymptotic in nature. Therefore, it's well justified to use this idealized cache model. Um, and when we're doing this analysis, typically we're interested in two things, uh, the amount of work, you know, the usual sort of thing, the ordinary running time. And also we're interested in a number of cache misses. And the one comment that I'd like to make with respect to cache oblivious algorithms, and we're going to look at a number of them as we proceed through subsequent slides, is that many of them are based on divide and conquer. The first example of a cache oblivious algorithm that I'd like to consider is a scanning algorithm. So in this particular algorithm, we have a one-dimensional array that consists of n elements. In this particular case, n is equal to 10. We have elements a0, a1, and so on, up to a9. And essentially what we want to do is just iterate over each one of the elements in this array and access its value. Um, as a matter of notation, the value b here corresponds to the 
number of array elements that fit in a single cache block. So in this particular uh, diagram, B is equal to four because we have four elements, A0 through A3, that fit within a single cache block. And what we want to do is we want to consider, again, an algorithm that scans through each of the elements of the array in order. And maybe we're doing this to compute a sum of the elements in the array, or maybe to compute a minimum or maximum. There's various different reasons why we might want to scan through the elements of an array. The amount of work that's required to do this is linear in the number of elements in the array. Assuming that the amount of work that we need to perform for each element that we're visiting is just constant. Um, when we're scanning through the elements, the amount of the number of cache misses that we're going to generate is going to be approximately n over b. Uh, we may have a ceiling and we may have a plus one, but approximately it's going to be n over b. So if we look at the top diagram on this slide here, and we consider scanning through the elements in this particular array, and we're going to assume that the cache is cold to begin with. In other words, none of the data is already in the cache. So when we access the element A0, we're going to get a cache miss because we're assuming the cache is cold to begin with, so the data is not in the cache. This cache miss is going to bring in not just A0, but the whole cache line. So A0, A1, A2, and A3 all get brought in from the cache. So we get a miss on A0, but then when we go to access A1, we get a hit, and A2 will give a hit, and A3 will give a hit. Then when we go to access A4, because this lies in a different uh, cache line, a different memory block, this is going to cause a cache miss. And then when we access A5, we're going to get a hit. A6 will give a hit and A7 will give a hit because when we brought in the data for A4, we also brought in the full cache line. So A5, A6, and A7 are also brought in. And this process kind of continues. So the pattern that we're, we're seeing here is that one out of every B memory access is, is going to miss, where in this case, B is equal to four. So in other words, one out of four memory accesses will miss. And this is essentially what leads to this n over b formula here. So essentially, one out of every b memory access is missed, so we're essentially dividing by b here. Um, the reason for the, the, the uh, ceiling operation here is that it's because of alignment, essentially, and similarly for the plus one. So if we look at the top figure again, you'll notice that in the last uh, memory block that we have here, two of the slots are not actually being used in this block. In other words, our array only uses half the elements in this last block. Uh, so when we go to access A8, we're going to get a cache miss, which brings in the whole block. I mean, technically, really all we want to do is bring in half the cache block, because we really only need half of the data. So when we compute n over b in this formula here, we're getting 10 over 4, which is 2.5. But you can't have 2.5 cache misses. There's, either you bring a cache block into the cache, or you don't. Uh, so if you have something like a half a cache miss, you have to round up to an in the next integer value. So this is the reason for this uh, ceiling operation here. The reason for the plus one is also due to alignment. So for example, I could slightly modify this example. So instead of having the picture at the top of the slide, we have the, one, the figure that's just below it. And all I've done is I've just shifted where the starting point is for the array so that it, it doesn't start aligned on a cache block boundary or memory block boundary. So because of this, the total number of uh, blocks in memory that are spanned by the data in this particular case is four. There's one, two, three, four blocks that all contain some data which is related to the array. Whereas in the diagram at the top, the data only spans three memory blocks, this block, this block, and this block. So depending how the data is aligned with respect to the memory blocks, you may incur slightly more or slightly less cache misses in order to handle the sort of the two end cases, the beginning and the end of the array. Um, this particular scheme is, is, is uh, cache obliv oblivious, obviously, because there's nothing in the algorithm that's using knowledge of the you know, cache parameters and so on. It's also optimal as well, because the, the data that's being accessed is only brought into the cache once. So we don't bring any cache blocks in multiple times, and this is the best that we can do. Obviously, in order to scan through the array, we're going to have to bring in each cache block that contains data for the array once. And for an optimal solution, we only want to bring each cache block in once, which is what we do. So this scheme actually is optimal. The next algorithm I'd like to consider is array reversal. So with array reversal, what we have is a one-dimensional array with n elements in it. And what we'd like to do is reverse the order of the elements. And we'd like to do this in place so that no additional storage is required. 
In this particular example that's shown at the, in the figure at the top of the slide, n is equal to 10. In other words, there's 10 elements in the array. They're numbered from 0 up to 9. And the quantity b, which is labeled in this diagram, corresponds to the number of array elements that a cache block can hold. So in this particular case, b is equal to 4. The way this array reversal algorithm works is it performs two parallel scans. One scan which starts at the beginning of the array, A0, and scans in the forward direction, and another scan which starts at the end of the array, at A9, and scans in the backward direction. And essentially what we do is we, we swap the corresponding elements of, that are associated with the forward and backward scan. So for example, we swap A0 and A9, then the forward scan moves forward by, by 1 to A1, and the backward scan moves backward to A8, then we swap A1 and A8, and so on. And eventually, the backward and forward scan will meet somewhere in the middle, and when they meet, the algorithm is done. And the total number of swap operations that will be required is the floor of n over 2. So the amount of work required by this algorithm is going to be order n, in other words, linear in the, the size of the array, the number of elements in the array. In terms of the cache performance, if we assume that at least two blocks can fit into the cache, then the number of cache misses that will be incurred by this algorithm is going to be approximately n over b. Uh, we also have a possible like ceiling operation and a plus one as well due to alignment considerations. Uh, but let's just consider the n over b first of all. So when we're scanning in the forward direction, for example, suppose that we've just, we're just about to read the value of a1 in the forward scanning direction, and we're just about to read the value of a8 in the backward scanning direction. When we access a1, this is going to generate a cache miss, assuming that the cache was cold to begin with. This is going to bring in not just the value of a1 in, into the cache, but it's going to also bring in a2, a3, and a4, which are all in this associated with the same block in memory. And when we access A8, this is going to bring A7, A6, A5 all into the cache as well. So when we're scanning forward, we, hit a, we get a miss for A1, but then a hit for A2, A3, A4. And similarly, when we're scanning backwards, we get a miss for A8, but then a hit for A7, A6, and A5. So generally what we end up with is one out of every B memory operations is going to miss, every, one out of every B memory accesses, where in this case, B is equal to four. Uh, so because of this, since there is the total number of accesses in N and then we miss in one out of every B uh, memory accesses, this means that we're going to have approximately N over B misses. Uh, the reason for the, the ceiling and the plus one is depending on how the first element and the last element is aligned with respect to the memory block boundaries, it's possible that we could get slightly more than N over B uh, cache misses just to handle the alignment. Uh, the reason why we have to make the assumption that at least two blocks fit into the cache, if this is not the case, then we'll get much poorer uh, cache performance. The reason why is that imagine that we're um, in doing the forward scan and we're currently sitting at A1, just about to read the value of A1, and we're doing the backward scan and we're sitting at A8. Um, when we read A1, this also brings into the cache A2, A3, and A4. If, however, only one block fits into the cache rather than two, when we access A8 in the backward scan after this, this will cause the cache block that holds A1, A2, A3, A4 to be evicted. So then when we proceed to access A2 in the next step in the forward scan, we get a cache miss. And similarly, we'll get a cache miss for A3, A4, and for all the remaining elements as well. And also in the backward scan, for a similar reason, we'll miss on every single access. So essentially, every access to the array is going to miss if, it, if at least two blocks can't fit into the cache at once. But for any practical system, it's probably quite reasonable to assume that you can fit at least two blocks into the cache at any given time. Uh, so the particular algorithm that we're describing here, obviously it's cache oblivious because there's nowhere where we're exploiting parameters as a cache. It's also optimal as well because the best that we can really hope for here is approximately n over b cache misses. Essentially what we're doing is we're bringing each of the blocks that holds data into the cache once and only once. And this is, again, this is the best that we can do assuming that the cache is cold to begin with. The next algorithm I'd like to consider is matrix transposition. And to begin with, we're going to consider just a very naive implementation of matrix transposition, like what's shown in the code on this slide. 
So we have this transposition function. It takes an input matrix A, and then it outputs the transposed version into B. And we're assuming in this code that A and B aren't alias, so they're actually distinct areas in memory. Otherwise, this algorithm is not likely to work very well. If you focus on what this code is doing, really the line that's most of interest is line number five, because this is where we're accessing the A and B arrays. The innermost loop here is looping over J. So because of this, when we're doing this innermost loop here, the thing that's varying is J, which means that we're going to be accessing A by reading across rows, because when inside this innermost loop, the row is fixed, it's the column that's varying. So we're gonna be reading across rows of A, and we're going to be reading down columns of B. Now the accesses to A are not really problematic because the, the arrays are stored in row major order. When we're accessing A reading along rows, we're going to be reading consecutive memory addresses, which is very friendly with respect to the cache. The thing that's problematic here is the way in which we're accessing B. We're essentially walking down columns of B. And again, because the arrays are stored in row major order, if we're walking down columns of B, we're going to be accessing memory with a large stride. And this is very uh, unfriendly to the cache. We're going to probably generate a lot of cache misses because we're not accessing memory in a sequential kind of manner. At the top of this slide, I have a diagram to help illustrate how the matrix transposition function from the previous slide operates. So what this diagram is trying to show at the top of this slide is what the innermost loop in the function that we we're just looking at does. So essentially the innermost loop of this matrix transposition function, it's scanning across a row of A, reading the values that are in that row. And it's also scanning down a column of B and then essentially writing the elements that it's reading out of the row of A into the column of B. And as far as caching is concerned, when we're scanning across this row of A, this is very friendly with respect to the cache because the array is stored in row major order. When we're reading, scanning across the row of A, this is going to be accessing uh, memory consecutively. Uh, so therefore we're going to get a large number of cache hits. Uh, the problematic thing is when we're scanning down the column, we're accessing memory with a very large stride and this could potentially generate a very large number of misses. So in terms of uh, notation on this slide, I'm going to use L to denote the number of uh, matrix elements that a cache block can hold. Um, the amount of work that's required by this algorithm is going to be order MN, which is essentially optimal. You can't really do any better than reading the total number of elements in the matrix that you're trying to transpose. Um, but really what we're interested in is more with respect to the caching effects or caching properties of this algorithm. Um, again, because of the way we're accessing the matrix B, this can potentially re result in a large number of cache misses. And in particular, the thing that's sort of the worst case scenario is if an entire column of B can't fit into the cache. So if an entire column of B can't fit into the cache, then what's going to happen is that every single access to B is going to generate a cache miss. And the reason for this is if a single column of B can't fit into the cache, what will happen is when we read, read the very first element at the top of a column, this will also bring in some of the surrounding elements in the same row into the cache, the other ones that reside in the same cache block. So for example, maybe the element that's just to the right of this one at the very top of the next column gets brought into the cache. So what we would hope is by the time that we proceed on to processing the next column, that that element will still be there and then we get a cache hit. But what will happen is if the entire column doesn't fit into the cache, then as we're scanning down this column, at some point we're gonna to start to evict elements from the top of the, that correspond to the top elements in this column. Because by assumption, we're saying, suppose that not all the elements and a column can fit in the cache at once. So by the time we hit the bottom of this column here, we're guaranteed then that the next element at the top of the next column has been, has been evicted from the cache. So then we're gonna get a miss. And then for the same reason, as we proceed down this next column, we're gonna miss on every single access. And this sort of process repeats. And effectively, every single access to the array B is going to miss. So overall, what we have in terms of the total number of cache misses, is we're going to have MN cache misses contributed by accesses to the matrix B because the total number of accesses to this array is MN and every single access misses. So this is where the MN comes from. And then the uh, ceiling of MN over L plus one 
if we ignore the plus one in the ceiling, effectively what we have is MN over L. And where this is coming from is we're accessing all the elements of the array A walking through memory consecutively. So essentially what's going to happen if we ignore alignment, which is essentially the reason why there's the ceiling here in the plus one, if we ignore alignment, then effectively what we have is approximately MN over L uh, cache misses because every ELF access is going to miss and in total there's MN accesses to the array A. Again, the ceiling and the plus one are just to account for the fact that depending on how the data in A is aligned with respect to cache blocks, we may have to get slightly more than MN over L, which is what the ceiling and the plus one is achieving. So effectively, the best that we can do here is if we ignore ceilings and plus ones, in other words, ignore alignment, essentially the best we can hold for is two MN over L cache misses. And effectively what this corresponds to is for each of the MN elements in the arrays A and B, we bring the cache blocks that contain those elements into the cache once and only once. And this is what gives us this formula here. But this, this number of cache misses here is much less than the number of misses that we're actually achieving with this algorithm. In other words, this algorithm is very suboptimal. So we can do better than this. And this is what we want to look at next and see if we can come up with a better approach that is more cache efficient. So the naive algorithm we've looked at for matrix transposition is not very efficient with respect to the cache. So we'd like to see if we can do any better than this. And what I'm going to consider is another algorithm for matrix transposition, one that's cache oblivious, and it's designed to be more efficient with respect to the cache. In particular, the algorithm that I'm going to consider is the one that's referred to by the name REC transpose, which appears in the paper that's listed on this slide. Uh, the authors, I believe, are with MIT. So what this algorithm does is it, it's given an M by N matrix A, an N by M matrix B, and it places the transpose of A into B. And A and B are assumed to correspond to distinct objects. In other words, this algorithm does not support in-place transposition. The algorithm is based on a divide and conquer strategy. And the basic idea is the algorithm halves the largest of the dimensions M and N and then recurs. And there are two cases to consider because essentially either M is the largest or N is the largest. So we have two cases in terms of which dimension we split along. And if M and N are equal, we just arbit arbitrarily choose between one of the two cases. So with this algorithm, there are two cases to consider. Either N is the largest dimension or M is the largest dimension. So in the first case, if N is the largest dimension, this means that the number of columns in A and the number of rows in B is the largest. So we're going to split along A in the direction of the largest dimension. So we're going to partition A in this manner. And we're going to split B along its lar largest dimension, which is along this direction here. And essentially what we do is we decompose the transposition into two smaller subproblems, which is B1 is A1 transpose and B2 is A2 transpose. And then we recurse to solve these two subproblems. Uh, the second case is that M is the largest of the two dimensions, which means that the number of rows in A and the number of columns in B is the largest. So in this case, again, we split along the largest dimension of A which is along the vertical direction. And we split along the largest dimension of B, which is along the horizontal direction. And this decomposes this transposition problem into two smaller problems, which is B1 is A1 transpose, and B2 is equal to A2 transpose. And then we recurse to solve these two subproblems. And conceptually, the recursion continues until M equals N equals one. In other words, we keep performing recursion until all the matrices that we're transposing in the subproblems are all one by one, and the transpose of a one by one matrix is trivial to compute. In practice, however, we typically stop the recursion earlier than this. The reason why is as we go deeper and deeper into the recursion, the number of function calls is growing exponentially. And we quickly reach a point where the overhead associated with a very large number of function calls becomes quite significant. Uh, so for this reason, we would typically stop the recursion uh, before we go all the way down to m equal n equal 1. On this slide, I have a simple example to help illustrate how the matrix transposition algorithm that we've been discussing works. So in this particular example, we have a 2 by 2 matrix to transpose. 
And if you remember generally how this algorithm works, it keeps splitting matrices along their longer dimensions. So in this case, because the matrix that we're transposing here is square, we can arbitrarily choose to split along the, num split along the rows or split along the columns. Uh, so in this particular case, I've just chosen to split along this line that's shown here. And correspondingly, I have to split B in the opposite direction because it's the transpose of A. So after we've done this splitting, essentially what happens is the top row of B and the left column of A go into the left subproblem, the one associated with the left child node. And then the bottom row of B and the right column of A go into the right subproblem, the one associated with this right child node. And then the process repeats. If we look at this node here, we're going to split A along its longer dimension. This A is taller than it is wide, so we're going to split along this line here. And then we split B in the opposite direction since it's the transpose of A. And then effectively what happens here is the left column of B and the top row of A go into the left subproblem here. And then the right column of B and the bottom row of A go into the right subproblem. And then a similar thing happens for the remaining node here. Again, we split along the longer dimension. In this case, A is taller than it is wide. So we're gonna split along this line that's drawn in here and split B in the opposite direction. And then the left column of B and the top row of A go into the left subproblem. And then the right column of B and the bottom row of A go into the right subproblem. And at this point, all of the nodes that we have reached at the bottom of the tree, they're all corresponding to transposes of one by one matrices. And this is a trivial computation to perform because the transpose of a one by one matrix is just itself. To give some further insight into this algorithm, I have some pseudocode for it. So essentially what we have here is a function called transpose. And it takes two parameters, which is something which identifies the part of the A matrix that we're currently dealing with and the part of the B matrix that we're currently dealing with. When we first call the transpose function, the part of the A matrix is going to refer to the whole matrix A, and then the part of the B matrix will refer to the whole matrix B. And then as we proceed, um, what's going to happen is we'll be invoking transpose recursively where part of A and part of B, these parameters here, will refer to different parts, different subblocks within the A and B matrices. And what we do inside this function, we check to see if the part of the A matrix and the part of the B matrix that we're dealing with are small enough. If they're small enough, then we just go ahead and compute the transpose. And the idea here is if the problem is small enough, probably the whole problem fits into the cache and we don't really have to worry too much about doing things in a very uh, cache efficient manner because things will probably automatically be cache efficient if the whole problem fits into the cache. If the problem's not small enough, that, then we go into the else clause here and this is when we essentially invoke ourselves recursively. So we're going to invoke ourselves recursively once for the left child in the recursion tree, which is the first call here, and then once for the right child in the recursion tree, which is the second function call here. And in each case, we're going to provide a new part of the A matrix and a new part of the B matrix to actually process. So part of A prime and part of B prime correspond to the subblock within the A matrix and B matrix, which is processed for the left child in the recursion tree. And the part of A double prime and the part of B double prime correspond to the parts of the A matrix and B matrix, which are processed in the right child in the recursion tree. Uh, an additional comment I can make about this algorithm that's important to note is the only place where we're really doing any work with respect to the transpose operation is in the base case for the recursion. In other words, in this place in the algorithm here, in the recursive function calls that we're making here, the only thing that we're actually doing is bookkeeping essentially to track what part of the A matrix and what part of the B matrix are we actually de dealing with. But there's not actually any accesses to the A and B matrices happening here. The only place where we're actually accessing these matrices to perform the transpose is in the base case for the recursion. Next, I'd just like to make a few comments with respect to how we identify the particular part of the A and B matrices that we're dealing with at any given point in time in the algorithm. So to help explain this, I have a diagram. So essentially for each of the A and B matrices, we have a picture which looks something like what's shown here. We have the full matrix, which is represented by this large rectangle here. 
Then we have the submatrix or sub block within this matrix, which is, which is represented by this smaller rectangle here. And the matrix, of course, the overall matrix has a certain width, it has a certain height. And then the submatrix has a certain width and a certain height. And in order to capture this picture here, in order to represent the particular part of the A or B matrix that we're dealing with, essentially what we need is something like a pointer to the very first element in the, the full matrix, for example, a pointer to this element here, uh, the width of the matrix, the height of the matrix, the width of the submatrix, the height of the submatrix, and either a pointer to this top left element within the, the uh, submatrix, or possibly a row column offset of this element with respect to the larger matrix. And essentially, this is the information that we need to capture in order to identify the particular subblock within the matrix that we're processing at any given time. Lastly, I'd just like to make a few comments about what it is about this algorithm that makes it efficient with respect to the cache. So to get an appreciation of the cache efficiency of this algorithm, we really need to consider a much larger matrix than the two by two matrix that we're considering in this example. A two by two matrix is probably going to fit into any reasonable size cache. Therefore, we're not going to get any cache misses no matter what we do probably, and the algorithm is going to be efficient. Uh, so we really need to consider a much larger matrix, maybe 1024 by 1024 or something like this. And in this case, there's gonna be many more levels to the recursion tree than just the three levels that we have on this slide. Um, one observation we can make about this algorithm is because it keeps partitioning the problems into smaller subproblems during the recursion process, eventually as you recurse deeper and deeper in the tree, eventually you're going to reach a point where the subproblems are small enough to fit in the cache. So essentially by using this divide and conquer approach, you're making the problems into smaller and smaller subproblems, and eventually the pro subproblems will fit in the cache, and then this helps to give you some good cache efficiency. Another observation that we can make is for any given node in the tree, so if we pick an arbitrary node, for example, this node here, all the descendants of this node are processing only data which is subsets of the data in this particular node. So for example, there's, well, in this case, there's only two descendants of this particular node. There's this descendant here and this one here, and all of them are processing just subsets of the data which is in the, the parent node. When you combine this with the fact that you're doing a depth first traversal of the tree in terms of the order in which you're processing nodes, um, this leads to a nice sort of locality in the app memory access patterns for the algorithm. And this is what helps to contribute to the algorithm having a reasonably good cache efficiency. On this slide, I have another example for the cache oblivious matrix transposition algorithm that we've been considering. In this particular example, we have a matrix which is slightly bigger than in the earlier example that we considered. And also this, in this example, the matrix isn't square. So here we have a matrix with three columns and two rows. And again, the algorithm is based on the idea of always splitting along the longer dimension. So in this particular case, the A matrix is wider than it is tall. So we're gonna split it along this line here and then split the B matrix, which is the transpose in the corresponding way. And then the uh, top, of the B matrix and the left side of the A matrix go into the left subproblem that we're solving. And then the bottom row of the B matrix and the right column of the A matrix go into the right subproblem. And then we basically recurse. So we do the same uh, processing over again for the left child. So in this case, the matrices are square. So we have some freedom in how we split, but I've chosen to split A along this line here. So we have to split B in the opposite direction since it's the transpose. And then the top row of B and the left column of A go into the left subproblem, and then the bottom row of B and then the right column of A go into the right subproblem. And then we continue splitting. If we go into this node here, we're going to split along the longer dimension. So this matrix A is taller than it is wide. So we're going to split along this line here and then split B in the opposite direction since it's the transpose. And then B11 and A11 go into the left subproblem, and then B12 and A21 go into the right subproblem. With this node here, it behaves in a similar way. Again, the, the matrix here A is taller than it is wide, so we split along this line here, which means we have to split along the corresponding direction for B. And then B21 and A12 go into the left subproblem, and B22 and A22 go into the right subproblem. And then the same sort of thing happens down this right, right branch over here. At this point, a very reasonable question to ask would be, 
what sort of performance do we get with this cache oblivious matrix transposition algorithm that we've been considering? In particular, what sort of cache performance do we get? So on this slide, I'm going to use L to denote the number of array elements that fit in a single cache block. And what you can show, we're not going to show this, but what you can show if you actually go through the work is that for an M by N matrix, this cache oblivious matrix transposition algorithm that we've been considering, the amount of work, work that's required is order MN. So in other words, it's proportional to the number of elements in the matrix that you're transposing. Uh, but more interestingly, if we assume the idealized cache model that was introduced earlier, you can show that the number of cache misses is order of one plus MN over L. And essentially it turns out that this is optimal. We can't really do better than this. So any matrix transposition algorithm is at least going to need to bring into the cache each block in memory that's associated with the input matrix and the output matrix for the transposition algorithm. So this means that for the input matrix, we're going to need to uh, bring in at least MN over L blocks approximately. And for the output matrix as well, we're need, going to need to bring into the cache approximately MN over L blocks. So in total, there's about two MN over L blocks that need to be dealt with. So the number of cache misses in the best case is approximately two MN over L. And asymptotically, essentially what we're talking about is order MN over L. So this is what we achieve here. So the actual algorithm is asymptotically optimal. We can't really do better in the asymptotic sense. So this algorithm does perform quite a bit better than the naive matrix transposition algorithm that we considered initially. The next algorithm that I'd like to consider is matrix multiplication. So at the top of this slide, I have a very straightforward implementation of matrix multiplication in this function called multiply. This function takes three matrices, A, which is an M by N matrix, B, which is an N by P matrix, and C, which is an M by P matrix. And essentially what this function does is it computes the product of the matrix A times the matrix B, and then stores the result into the matrix C. And this code is written in the most straightforward manner possible. If I asked you to very quickly implement a matrix multiplication algorithm without doing any sort of optimization and so on, most likely this is the code that you would write, something very similar to what's shown on this slide. If you look at the innermost loop, we have a number of nested loops here, but essentially the place where we're accessing the A and B matrix is in the innermost loop here. If you look at what's happening in the innermost loop, our looping variable is K. So in the innermost loop, the variable that's changing is K. This means that when we're accessing the array A, we're going to be walking along rows because K is changing in the innermost loop. So that means I is fixed, which means we're going to be walking along rows. So this is good with respect to the cache because the arrays are stored in row major order. So if we're walking along a row, we're going to be walking through consecutive addresses, which is good with respect to the cache. Uh, the problematic thing here, though, is going to be accesses to B. In the case of B, again, because K is varying in the innermost loop, this means that we're going to be walking down columns because in the innermost loop, K is varying and J is fixed. So this corresponds to walking down columns in B, which means that we're going to be accessing the memory associated with the matrix B with a large stride, which is going to be inefficient with respect to the cache. We'll probably generate a fairly large number of cache misses. As far as the matrix C is concerned, if we look at and see what's happening to the indexes I and J, essentially what's going to happen is we're going to scan left to right, top to bottom in the matrix C. So we're going to be walking through the addresses in C in consecutive order. So in terms of the accesses to the array C, things are pretty good with respect to caching since we're accessing a memory in consecutive order. So again, the problem here is really the matrix B, and we'd really like to be able to reorganize this algorithm, restructure it in such a way that we don't have one of the matrices being accessed in some way, which is very, very unfriendly with respect to caching, like what we have here. What I'd like to do next is to analyze the performance of the naive matrix multiplication algorithm from the previous slide. In particular, I wanna look at its performance with respect to caching. So just as a matter of notation, on this slide, L denotes the number of matrix elements that a cache block holds. So what the figure at the top of the slide shows is how the algorithm operates. So in the innermost loop, from the code on the previous slide, uh, the innermost loop is where K is varying. And what we're doing in the innermost loop is we're scanning across elements in a row of A, and we're scanning down elements in a column of B, and we're computing the dot product between them. 
Then in the next innermost loop, the loop that's looping over J, what's happening is that this column in B is scanning across from left to right. So to begin with, we're scanning down the first column of B. Then in the next value of J, we're going to be scanning down the second column of B and so on. And essentially, this column here that's shaded in is going to shift all the way from the left all the way across to the far right. And there's going to be P iterations since the number of columns in B is equal to P. Uh, then in the matrix C, what's happening is the, the uh, particular element that we're accessing is going to be scanning left to right, top to bottom. So it starts out in the top left and it scans left to right, and then into the next row, scanning across left to right, and then into the next row, scanning across left to right, and so on. In terms of the amount of work that's required for this algorithm, it requires order M and P work, which is essentially the best that we can do. Uh, this simplifies to order N cubed in the case that we have all square matrices involved, so M equals N equals P. Uh, the more interesting thing is what the cache performance of the algorithm is. So for this analysis, we're going to assume that a single row of A and a single column of B don't fit in the cache sim simultaneously. And if this is ca the case, then what we end up with is the number of cache misses is order of this expression here, MNP over L plus MNP plus MP over L. And if we let M equal N equal P, in other words, if we're dealing with square matrices, this is order N cubed. And it turns out that we can do much better than this. Uh, but before I leave this slide, I want to actually explain where this, this formula here is coming from. So if we look at the accesses to A, essentially what's happening as the algorithm is running is first we take multiple scans over A. We're going to scan over this single row of A P times, one once for each column in, in this matrix B. So as we're doing repeated scans here, because we're assuming a single row of A can't fit into the cache at once, this means that when we scan across, we're going to be reading consecutive addresses since the matrix A is stored in row major order. So this means that as we're scanning across in a single scan, we're going to incur N over L cache misses, approximately. Uh, but this process is going to be repeated P times because we have to make P scans, one for each column in, in the matrix B. So this is where this P comes from here. And then this row here is going to scan, like uh, trace out all the rows in the matrices. So it's going to start out, first of all, uh, being the, the very first row, then it will be the second row, and so on for all the M rows in the matrix. So we get this whole thing is multiplied times M. Then if we look at the matrix B, again, if we assume that a single column of B can't fit in the cache all at once, this means that when we start the scan of this particular column, we're going to bring into the cache several elements that are all at the top of the consecutive row, sorry, consecutive columns. All these elements are going to get brought into the cache um, so that when we complete this scan here, what we would hope for is that when we come up to the top of the next column, there's going to be a good chance we're going to get a cache hit. Uh, but if a single column of the, the matrix B can't fit into the cache at once, what this means is as we're scanning down the current column here, at some point the cache block that holds this top element here is going to be evicted which means when we hit the bottom of this column and then come up to the top of the next column, we're guaranteed that the, 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 the data that corresponds to the element at the top of this column won't be in the cache, which means we miss. And by the same logic, we're going to get a cache miss for every element that we access down the next column and so on. This whole process repeats and essentially you get a cache miss for every single access to B. And the number of accesses to B that you have is M times N times P. And then in the case of the matrix C, what's happening here is we're tracing out the elements in the matrix C in essentially raster scan order. So left to right, top to bottom. So we're scanning across a row, then we go on to the next row, scan left to right in that row and so on until we hit the bottom of the matrix. So the number of cache misses we're going to have will be the number of elements in the matrix, which is M times P, and then divided by the number of elements that fit in a single cache block, which is L. So this is where this particular formula comes from. And again, we can do much better than this. So the cache performance of this algorithm is not very good. And since I just noticed that we're running out of time, I'm going to stop here for today.